because part of recovery, mental recovery, is to release that to other people, to share that issue, that burden, if you like, and give you a different perspective on how you rebuild. Episode 92. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week in the Zoom account yet again, and I'm speaking with a very special guest um, who is from outside of the architecture industry. I'm talking with Mark Wood, who's an established polar explorer and adventurer who operates within the extremes of our planet. Exploration, to Mark, is about global communication through education, and he has served in the British Army, he's served as a firefighter, and he has led teams for major polar and mountain expeditions operating in areas such as the Arctic Circle, the Himalayas, Antarctica, Alaska and the Norwegian and Canadian High Arctic. Mark has completed over 30 major expeditions around the world including a solo expedition to the South Geographic Pole and he has also completed a 200 mile solo crossing of the Arctic Ocean to the Geographic North Pole which became part of a Channel 5 documentary. So I thought Mark was an absolutely incredible person to have on the show and I really wanted him to share with us some of his insights into living in isolation, leadership in extreme conditions and also the business aspects behind these landmark events which he goes on and creates these incredible teams for. So Mark talks a lot about how he raises finance and capital for these adventures and, and explorations and also about leadership and how we can be preparing ourselves for beyond lockdown. So sit back, relax and enjoy Mark Wood Explorer. And if you're interested in finding out more about Mark, Mark's got a couple of fantastic books which are available now. I'll put the link in the information to this podcast. There's one called Solo Explorer and another one called Rock and Ice Expedition. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Mark, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to see you. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. Isolating well. Excellent. Fighting by the rules. Good, good. That's what I like to hear. Um, yeah, so you're an explorer, and I thought it would be interesting to have you on the show today to talk a little bit about your career and your, your work and the places that you've been, how you got into that, but also the mindset and particularly what we're dealing with now and for business leaders, the kind of difficulties that we're facing, you know, organizing people, the isolation and leadership in lockdown. And I thought you would be one of the, you know, some of the best, best people on the planet to talk about these types of issues. Um, so I think we'll start off by just getting a little bit of background about you and how did you, how did you become an explorer? What is, what is, uh, what I made kind that of... title up. Um, <laughs> it's a, you don't go to a job centre or anything like that and have just decided to do it. Um, I, it's a series of events over a lifetime. So it's, it's a bit like when people at my age look back and then they can see the path that they took. Mm. Um, but when I left school, I joined 
the military just for a short time, four years. And then I moved into, I did a little bit of traveling uh, in my twenties and then I moved into fire and rescue. Um, and then I was looking for something different to do as we can all do now, um, go on little adventures and that around the world. Uh, well, not particularly now, but you know, generally in this, in this age. Um, and then I, <clears throat> I, I then fell in love with the environment. I went in to exploration to test myself physically and mentally and be that explorer, polar explorer that I'd read about in books. Mm. But then I started to understand the environment and uh, had an appreciation and then saw a worth in what I was doing through education. And that's why I gave up everything in life and dedicated myself to exploration. Um, just a, as a thing, as an introduction, if somebody asks me to describe what I do, they usually expect me to say oh, I'm an explorer. But what I say is I create uh, extreme educational programs um, for young people around the world using Mount Everest or the polar regions as a backdrop. That's what yeah, I do. The last place that I... Um, ran an expedition in was uh, in the Himalayas, the south side of Mount Everest. Um, and the, the importance of that expedition was the very first journey I did 18 years ago, I linked to 20 young people in my old school in Coventry. Um, and I had a sat phone and I was crossing the Northwest Passage in, in high Arctic Canada. And uh, that's when I kind of understood that I could connect from the extremes. 18 years later on Everest last year, we link to over 1.2 million students worldwide. So that's the real worth of what I do in 18 years. That's extraordinary. How are you doing that? Via Skype meetings or like webinars or how does that work? Well, we um, did a series of Skype links and we use social media. I mean, 18 years ago, social media was just about creeping forward. Yeah. Um, in fact, it wasn't existing at that time. Um, but the satellite phone that I was using, the kids were had speakers out in the classrooms mm. and they sat around the speakers and I would describe where I am on the satellite phone and then they would then ask me questions and look at the map in the, in the classroom. Um, and then we advanced in 2013, we did an Everest ascent and we advanced to 10,000 young people and I was um, speaking to a thousand kids at a time in their schools around the world via Skype. And then we thought, well, we can expand that to what, as many students as possible. And what we did, we did an online program with in, last year with uh, Skype in the classroom and Lonely Planet Kids, who did an online presence, which was attracting a lot of children and teachers. And then we actually spoke to young people via Skype um, <clears throat> on the whole approach approach to, to the mountain itself. Mm. So very successful extreme classroom experiences. Wow. And and for you, what what are the lessons that you take away from each of these explorations? What are the what are the major skill sets that you need to you've needed to develop in order to be able to do these journeys? For me to do do it for them. Um, well there's there's a two way thing. What what do I teach them? What can they learn and what can I sort of learn from that? So what, what they learn in the first instance of is just four things. Because you've got to remember that I'm actually speaking, communicating to um, human beings. So that's the connection we have. But they all live in different parts of the planet. And isn't that wonderful? The different cultures and religions and, and environment areas, etc. And issues with climate change are all different around, even though it's connected. So how do I sort of have that 15 minutes window to speak to these guys so they understand. So I have four sort of principles I stick by. And the first one is I try and teach them and really everybody uh, a respect for themselves. Mm. So I think in life, everything comes from here. And if you can be a good person and just be that nice person, you don't have to be loud or anything like that, but just be a decent person, decent human being, then a lot can happen for you in your lifetime because people will respect you and they'll rely on you and you know and even though you you might not be well educated or have skills in certain areas you are that person that they want to spend time with so it's really important 
The second thing is to have an equal respect for the environment. Um, and, and we're not saying, you know, save the whole planet because it can be there and individuals uh, can, like Greta, she can, you know, rise up and, and influence a lot of young people and adults. So never underestimate the power an individual has to make great changes. Mm. But just look at your own environment and see your own house, influence your family, your community, your school. And then the, four, the third one is just think differently about life. So these are very simple acts that you don't spend money on. Just mm. think differently about life. Look at your path of life and go, well, do I want to do that or do I want to do this? You know, um, which might sound strange, but it is about enjoying moments as you're going through. And that leads me on to the fourth one, which is something I struggle with um, because I'm a grumpy old bloke. <laughs> uh, just having fun. You know, your life is laid out for you. Things will happen which will upset you and 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 you you will go through dark times because that's just the way it is so you've got to really enjoy the moment when it happens mm. um, I, I take a lot of photographs and as, as everybody does uh, but mine are in the extreme a lot of the times and sometimes I bring the camera down and just collect memories really um, because it's important to appreciate life I'm a realist by the way so it's it's about doing it's about just I've learned from my mistakes so that's why I've built those four things up mm. but then from my side um, what I've learned from this uh, is really about how I can how I can use this medium how I can embrace technology as Shackleton did mm. on his expedition because Shackleton didn't have Zoom, Skype and all that, but he brought along Frank Hurley, who was a great photographer, a filmmaker, photographer. And uh, he took great photographs of the Shackleton expedition. And I think Shackleton knew what he was doing because those photographs are now in uh, schools all the way around the world. Mm. and the real influence on people we've all seen the ship trapped in ice that iconic picture yeah so it's important for people like me to be inspired by, by what i see because that's the drive i have the passion of mm. what i see and how i feel if i didn't have that passion i couldn't do what i do because it's very tough what i do mm. um, but then i thought okay i'm enjoying this how can i then send this to other people well we're very lucky in this area that we can use all this technology and sat phones and things like that to bring people into that that world so you, you said there that what you do is very tough and you were talking about the extreme environments for you what are the what are the toughest things about these expeditions and and what is the most extreme aspects of the environments so, you know, it's these, some of these questions, you might not expect the answers to be what you want. But the toughest part of an expedition is gaining the confidence of investors. Wow, interesting. <laughs> Very you interesting. I mean, it is because, you know, let me take the solo expedition to the South Pole, followed by the North Pole in 2011 and 12. Mm. Um, a lot of the viewers who will be looking at this, be like we don't haven't got a clue mark what it is but i've been operating for 18 years now yeah um, but i've never worked on profile i've always worked on getting my hands dirty and and doing and producing great expeditions and education and business stuff mm. um so so with that um it's sometimes it's difficult to step into a large corporate company and say do you want to invest in this great idea? Mm. Um, especially through times at the moment, it's, it's very much on the, on the, the back burner for them. But what, what, what's, what's the kind of relationships that you, you have with businesses then? How does that, how does that work? Do they become sponsors? What sorts of brand alignments do you have to have in place? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a few. So it could be a brand alignment as in, you know, kit. Uh, it could be um, tech support through holding a, a website base for you to 
to display what you're doing on there and to engage with people. Um, it could be a film. We're developing a film at the moment. So you've got production companies and that who, who want to sort of be a part of what you're doing. Um, so there is that sort of um, tangible side of it, mm. uh, which really does support the, the outreach of what you're doing. Um, but then there's the actual physical side. And I can't do what I do unless people invest money into the projects. So what I've learned over the years is that um, you've got to, we can't give money back. That's the thing. So you've got to have something which works for them and is in the moment. And in the moment, the moment is education, business leadership, understanding the environment, um, and very much in the moment as why we're speaking is isolation. How do you cope with an unstable future? Yeah. So all of these things that, that I do, you know, so, um, uh, and, but I always refer back to the first learning of the four things for the children, mm. the respect for yourself. If I'm, I've got to be going in to speak to these directors of companies as, as an honest person, because they're not stupid. You know, you've got to sit in front of the right people and go, look, look, this is what I'm thinking of over the next two years. And the engagement, the outreach is incredible. And we'd love you to come on board. Mm. You've got to be that good person, really, and understanding of their time and their work. Um, and it's kind of worked with a company like Skype. It re worked really well because they stayed with me for 10 years. Yeah. And unfortunately, they've sort of broken down in the UK and they're more us based now with microsoft but um we still have a connection w with them which is which is good uh, uh, that's a, it is a really interesting answer actually to the question about actually the, the toughest part of these expeditions is finding the finance and obviously this is something that every business owner can relate to when you're trying to get investment for any sort of project there is this process of having to enroll other people into what it is that you're doing how do you what what do you find is a successful way of getting people involved in projects like how do you how do you um find out what's important to them well the first thing is you've got to get your own acting or you get your own stall in order first you've got to yeah. be confident in your product and what you're saying now, if anybody's listened to this I, I gave a talk for a hairdressing convention once you know i mean explain <laughs> you know and and and, and you go, I, can, I can see that how, how, how did they bring you in yeah. but um it, I, what i did i talked about the importance of brand mm. the importance of brand in a, in most places is that first person they meet that's yeah. the brand yeah um and then behind them is the actual product um sometimes it the product is so good that you kind of put up with the, the arrogance of the person in front of it. But generally it's whether you want to work long, that only lasts for a while and it yeah. doesn't build for a happy relationship. So it's, you know, if you build a happy relationship and a good working sort of team, then you can go on for a few years with this. So then you get into your question, what I do, I mean, I never went to business school. Remember this. I mean, I learned from mistakes. This is all churned from getting it wrong, basically. Um, but what I do now is I, I think I, I have a seed of an idea. What do I want to do? Taking the next expedition as an example, if you like. It's called Solo 100. And I think, well, I want to extend my time in the Arctic to 100 days solo and supported. Okay, completely crazy idea. Um, how can I do this? How can I, how can I physically do it on ice? So that's one element. How can then I get the? How can I build the education? How do I do that? How do I bring it all in? Because every single day there's going to be a film from children around the world being released. So a hundred films from kids around the world. How do we put that together? How do we get the investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But that's all in my head and I'm sitting there spinning because all these ideas are there. So what I do is I just dump it all onto a, a whiteboard um, and level out the investments and uh, the opportunities, the filming, everything, everything that's in my brain, bang on a wall. And then I walk away and I do a very English thing. 
I make a cup of tea. <laughs> 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 and I go up my garden, I distance myself from that craziness of my idea. Yeah. Um, but what's inspired me in that moment is the fact that I think it's a great idea and I feel that surge within me. But I've, I've thrown it somewhere else for a time being. Mm. I've walked away from the situation. And I don't want to get too profound about this, but if you think about art, which is my, my first love, if you like, um, an artist will paint and then walk away and come back with fresh eyes. And that's what you're doing. You're coming back with a fresh eyes and a little bit of an empty head to think creati creatively about this. Um, so then you sit down and you look at that whiteboard and you go, okay. And I do that. I stare at it and think, okay, that's the money. That's the timeline. And then you lean back and you think, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. You know, up to that point, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> because it's your only time and and then what you've got to do that what i do then is, is i package it i you know you build a a good slick clean easy to read um website with honesty and the worth of the expedition in there you build up the worth so they can see mm. that straight away you then replicate that into a pdf i do hard copies but i tend to turn away from hard copies it's nice to give somebody a hard copy it's generally not read um so i look at pdfs and then i get together what i'm going to say it's already within me because it's been grown within me anyway yeah yeah and then and then i sit down with my manager um and some of the guys i've worked with on expeditions confidence of guys will turn around and rather than say this is awesome they'll go it's great but you need to do this this and that so I'm building a team that will have the confidence within them to to go against some of the things that I think is good. Mm. You need that. If you get tunnel vision, then you can really. And, and I suppose so. That, so before the expedition, expedition has happened, there's quite a lot of promotional work that happens in in having that your yeah. team, team around you. And then post the expedition, is there a similar sort of amount of stuff? Yeah. That happens? Basically, what you're building into that initial deck is pre. Uh, expedition expedition and post expedition and a lot of my expeditions uh, are big as in the outreach is big um, and the expeditions generally that they become almost historical value to it yeah so you think about Ellen MacArthur's expedition uh, around the world the sponsors for that are still 20 odd years I think later are still reaping the rewards of that singular expedition um, you know, in functions and things like that. Oh, this is amazing. I mean, I've never, yeah. I've never put it all together. Actually, the, the kind of the huge value that being associated with something like this is, it's like a historical artifact. Your business is going to be, it totally, it's a very powerful brand, like to be associated with these sorts of uh, events. It is, but you've got to think that if I'm an idiot and I'm obnoxious and horrible, it's a terrible brand. So you yeah. can, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I know we're live now, so I'm not, <laughs> there's words I'd like to use, but if you, if you are dishonest, let's say, or whatever, in whatever you're doing, then you're going to be found out. It's, you're going to be found out. And, you know, I am flawed in many, many ways, but that's the interesting side, I think. That's the human side. Mm. And if a brand is trying to attract people to, what, to their own brand, it doesn't have to be an exploration brand. In fact, it works sometimes if, you, if you're not, if you're very much the other. So Ellen MacArthur's sponsors were B&Q. I mean, what the, I mean, she had yeah. the best packing on her ship. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a throwaway joke. Um, but, you know, it's very much sort of like, well, why would they do that? But you imagine that on their side, the, the, when somebody walks in, that's the, the thump of the pictures that they'll have on their walls to start off with. And mm. then it's the, the um, why she did it, you know, the words that you can come out with, inspired, uh, whatever it might be that she had within her. They will use those words for their own, you know, their own company. Yeah. But, um, and, and really what it is, is I laid the deck out, as I've said, then you go and speak to companies. If the timing is right, yeah, because at the moment it's not. If the timing is right and you've got the right people in the room, you present what you've done, but then really the, the important thing is what do they want? 
Mm. Because that's the gray area of saying, look, this is what we've got, but we're very open to what you actually want. Now, if you can read up on that beforehand, and then that works really well. What, what, do you mind me saying just one thing yeah, about please. this? Because it, this sounds great, right? What I do, there's this tremendous amount of knockbacks and negativity, and no, we won't get involved. You're knocking on a lot of doors, yeah. respectfully, and... Um, as my manager says, she says, you, you kiss a lot of frogs, you know? Um, so rejection is a strange thing. If you're, if you're very certain that this needs to happen, this expedition needs to go, um, then it will happen. The timing, who knows, but it will happen. Mm. Timing is dictated by a lot of things. That's why we're speaking in this. Yeah. But, um, sometimes when you you work with a company for a long time and then suddenly they say no, you look at that as if, well, I don't have to spend too much time with them now. So you create more space to think and to to work with other people. So it's a positive thing. Hmm. Also, if a company says, no, sorry, we, we can't do this at the moment, you've built a good relationship up with them. And look, at the end of the day, they need to make money for their company and keep their employees paying, you know, paying their mortgage and stuff. So I do get it. Mm. I do get rejection, but it's about saying, I do get that. It's fine. Do you know any other companies? Would you like me to give you a talk? Is there any way I can help you in this dark time? You know, you know, you keep in there with these people and keep that relationship going. Mm. Um, rejection is, can be looked at very, very, differently so um don't take it as a positive don't just walk away understand and learn basically how do you know or how do you make a how do you begin making a list of which companies to approach or do you have like a a, a sort of maybe an agent or a team that's helping you and, and you're kind of making the 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 jump if you like thinking oh you know b and q that could be a good a good sponsor or well we've been doing this for quite a few years so there's a lot of people that we know which you've got to approach them each time um with a fresh new project product um so we'll speak to them not necessarily that they will get involved um but they might know somebody so it's very much sort of investigating work and, mm. and that's the hard work that's why we haven't really spoken about ice or mountains at the moment. It's all yeah. about the business side of what we do. Mm. When you eventually are dra dropped off by the helicopter or plane, then it's down to me. You know, that's me now. now I can, it's for me to perform. But up until that point, I'm reliant on a lot of other people to, to support this, this um, dream, if you like. Yeah. Are there any companies that you wouldn't approach? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's obvious things because we, we deal with children, we deal with the environment. So you've got to be very careful to align yourself with the right companies. But um, in terms of the environmental side, it's, you know, preaching to the converted is, is, a, is a big thing, really. Um, you need to get into conversations with companies that are trying their best to be green and mm. to support the environment. Um, and, a, a, you know, a big one is like the oil companies and things like that. I mean, it's what the hell is an explorer doing with oil companies? I've never been involved with them. But it would be interesting to sort of sit in a room and see what they're actually doing and, and uh, whether they are sort of converting in some way. Um, but it, it is a little bit hard. And you've got to be very strong as, a, as an explorer to if they're dangling you know, money in front of you, then you've got to really stick by your mom morals. Yeah. And we've done that. We've managed to do that over the, the period of time, which again, we're quite proud of really. Amazing. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what we're dealing with right now in terms of, you know, business leaders, everybody, you know, all of us kind of in lockdown at the moment and, you know, we're getting, it's the lockdown is seemingly starting to lift a little bit there are kind of changes that are happening but there's been a big impact on you know being able to organize your team and then kind of coming out of that what are, what's some of the advice that you've got from how you deal with your expeditions that you could impart on what we're dealing with now in terms of isolation 
Well, it's funny, this conversation is, we're, we're, I think we're about 50 odd days into the isolation, aren't we? Yeah. So we are in tune with a lot of stuff. Um, so in terms of an expedition, right at the very start, when I was speaking to companies about this and individuals of so friends were phoning me up saying, what the hell do I do? You know, because, you know, families operate well, but they go, kids go to school and parents go to work and then they all congregate in the evening. And, um, but now we're all locked or a lot of people are locked in the house together. So there's a lot of confusion with that. Mm. Um, and then there's also the uncertainty of business, et cetera. So we know all of this. So the three simple, or the four simple things that I had for, for early, early isolation was uh, snap into a routine as quickly as possible. Um, and don't beat yourself up if you don't stick to that routine completely. You know, I mean, this is in certain times. And if you need to go for a walk and do something different, then do that, you know. Um, but try and get into a routine a part of being let's say in a prison on your own or maybe solo in across the arctic or or living in a city surrounded by millions of people but you're still alone mm. um routine is very very important um and especially i think as a business person working from home if you can structure your work um then then that's that will allow you to do it um i've lived the second one is i've lived in a tent going towards the north pole with two other guys and they're bigger than me um and we're in this little tent and if we had to say a this is a phone but a coffee cup or something and we put it into their space then that would be world war three mm -hmm. so it's it's can't we understand each other's spaces you know, um, and I think when you're at home, it's a similar sort of thing. You're living on top of each other. So just to allow people that space. And with that, you, you've got to allow people their own personalities. We're all very, very different, loud, quiet, whatever it might be. So understand those characters within your family. Um, they need a bit of time, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, and then it's about keeping healthy. Mm -hmm. And this is where the government worked well at the start, taking hours, uh, training a day, whether it's walking the dog or running or whatever it might be, um, you know, showering, just the basics, you know, keeping healthy in that sense and food as well. And I think a lot of families have actually are cooking together, which is so many positives come out of this, you know, cooking, sitting at the table together, maybe enjoying or fighting on the table, <laughs> yeah. whatever you're as a family eh? um but then that's the three things that i'd say but the, the whole thing that binds it all together is communication mm -hmm. um and you know we talk about communication satellites and you know skype talks business blah, blah, blah. but communication amongst the family is a real learning process because you know each other so well that somebody to dictate is really wrong you need to be level um and one advice on top of that would be if you're feeling the pressure then walk away from the situation mm. breathe go up the garden breathe listen to some music some soft music whatever it might do to calm you down it's not a stupid thing to do mm. because everybody's going to go through this um when I train people, when I've trained people in the Arctic, you'll take some of the hardest people know into the Arctic. And because the Arctic has a way of breaking you down, it's, um, it's so vast to begin with that you feel claustrophobic in that vastness because you can't get out of it. Yeah, so you panic. Um, the cold can get to you. Everything can get to you. But one other thing that gets to you is just being normal, being human. Meaning that if you, if you and I were working together for 10 days, mm. you might feel during that 10 days, no reason at all, no reason at all that you just have a bad day. Happens. I yeah. don't know why I ate well, I slept well, I've been cool. I just having a bad day. When you're in the Arctic and you're having a bad day, you blame your weaknesses, your mental strength. Can I do this? I shouldn't be doing this. When you're isolated as a family and you're having a bad day, 
oh, the virus, where are we going to find the money, what's going to happen, everything gets on top of it. So you've just got to do the simple thing of stepping away, stepping out of that tent, mm. walking 100 metres into the Arctic, looking back at the tent, which is this big, and going, all my problems are in there, okay? And just enjoying the view of the Arctic while you're there in the first place. Mm. So embrace this moment, I think, and um, use it as a way of reflecting on you, your family, where you want to go with your work. Um, and it will really help. Mm. The, just one last thing. I know I'm saying one last thing, one last thing, but that's all well and good. But sometimes you do need to speak to a colleague. So I, I was in Antarctica and I broke down on the fifth day of a 50 day expedition. I was on my own. Um, I didn't think I could do it. I've just lost my iPod. So I had nothing to think of for those 45 remaining days. And I sort of stayed in a tent for a day and a half. And I phoned a colleague back at home who's been on many expeditions and he talked me back on my feet and, you know, I moved on. I put one foot in front of the other, et cetera, and reached the pole. But at that moment in time, I needed somebody to speak to. And I think that's really important. Don't think that you have to hold this in because part of recovery, mental recovery, is to release that to other people, to share that issue, that burden, if you like, and give you a different perspective on how you rebuild. Mm. Uh, you will see, and I spoke to some businesses about this, business leaders, and I said to them, you, will, you might see, in an area we live in now, it's very open for people to talk about their mental health, that how they are at the moment. You know, there is a brand of mental health on it. Yeah. And so people still don't really want to talk about it. But when you move back into normality again, they are going to find almost like a, a mild breakdown in some people. So... I've advised leaders to talk to their team on mass to say, welcome back. We were, you know, we're a family. This is our product. We need to get it out there and to give that sort of good, honest chat to these people, making sure they feel part of, of the way forward, mm. but then to offer individual chats or not even offer, just bring them into an office situation or whatever, and just say, you know, how's it been? <laughs> you know, and you might not be the guy because you might be a 53 year old male who's talking to a 19 year old female. So it might be worth recruiting different people within your team to connect with the right person. Mm. And all you're doing is having a bit of a shoulder there to say, is everything all right? And then monitor that because it is important. You, the company is only as good as its team. Mm. And that's to, that's Apple as well. You know, I mean, this is the big companies. If a, if a company, if the individuals don't care, then it's going to be very difficult to move that brand forward. Yeah. Well, it's really powerful what you've, what you said, actually, just kind of taking the time to allow people to share <laughs> what their experience has been. And this kind of, you know, as we start into, you know, move back into work or go back into our offices and come back, come back together um it's not going to be a sudden back straight into it there's going to be people are going to be dealing with all sorts of stuff that we don't know and if there's not some sort of valve to allow that to come out and to share it then you know you run the risk of kind of um, isolating people further or people still being in isolation even though they're with each other yeah that's true um, one of the other coping mechanisms at the moment which helps to to keep the stress off you and allow you to sort of move back into semi normality um, is information gathering. Mm. Um, so I've been in situations in the fire and rescue service where we've been on a car accident or a massive house fire or whatever. And usually, well, all the time in this situation is a command and control. So you have somebody there commanding the whole scene. And what their job is, is to stand back from operations um, and to look at the safety, look at who he puts into the scene itself. So in the scene, you will have you know, guys with cutting gear, guys stabilizing the casualties. And then next to the commander, you'll have uh, a runner who's like comms or whatever. You'll have advisors. You then have 
paramedics and further firefighters, if you like, waiting to be um, put into the scene of operation. And behind that, you've got the police and other people supporting. If you relate that to the current situation, command and control for me is the government. Okay, right. and that's gray area is debatable. You can fight over how good or bad they are. In, a, in something like a crisis like this, you need to look at the government for direction. And one of the great things they're doing is they're looking at um, the, the World Health Organization for advice. They're using scientists for advice. And they're not saying science like America is doing. Yeah. You know, and I don't, not America. The president basically and i don't want to get into him but it is a very different way of of giving out information mm. so they've been doing that really well but then you get social media and i love social media i think it's brilliant the way that it, it brings out issues around the planet it allows people to come together you raise 30 million from some wonderful guy who was in the military walking around his garden you know that's the the inspiration of, of social media but it can be a verse as well where people experts come out the window like me <laughs> <laughs> you know come out. <laughs> they come out it's me saying all this i mean yeah but that's the point you know take me with a pinch of salt you know but i'm not saying to people i'm giving my experiences here i'm not dictating anything here it comes from a very different angle and especially when you're hammering at the government at this moment mm. uh, the government are there to be this is freedom of speech so that's fine but you need to, in this really important time, when we need to get back on track, we need strong leadership. And, and that's so important. We're animals. Mm. And he's taken to 70 million people. Up until this point, they've done really well. Stay at home, exercise for an hour, key workers. We've got it. 70 million people-ish, because some are idiots. We've got it, yeah? And now we're moving into, well, you, you can go back there, you can go back there. So the, the speech the other day was a little bit sort of gray in some areas. Yeah. Um, however, I will say this, and I think it, it is, this is like going to be, you know, the controversy in this. Listen to what he said. Look at your own situation mm. and deal with it as you responsibly, you know. That's the simple fact. And he kind of said that. He said, kind of work it out for yourself. You're not idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you go on social media, if you go on all these different platforms, you will get confusing um, sort of uh, information. So what I've done is basically just listen to the news at night. Mm. And, and I speak to guys that I, I, I like, if you like, and I can chat with them. Um, and then I'm governed by all of that. Well, I, th I think that that's really important what you've, <clears throat> what you've just said there, actually, as well, and kind of, listening to leadership and you know we, we can you can go into criticizing and holding people accountable and what went wrong that that's not the, necessarily the thing to be doing right now no. um we're still on expedition yeah we're, st we're still on that journey and what how we act now would dictate the speed and outcome of the expedition itself that's it now mm. after the expedition which is when they find a virus so it could be next year. We could be all working within a few months and life will go back to sort of semi-normality. But until you've got that virus, then it's not going to sort of return totally. Mm. But then once this is sort of over, he says, um, then yes, you do need to look back on what happened. How did the government act? How did organizations act? That's all part of rebuilding for the next event that will happen. You've got to learn from the situation. And if we look back and go, well, we were the worst government in the world to do that, and Boris Johnson should be at it, then that's fine. Mm. You know, work on the evidence that you have. But at the moment, we're still fighting the battle. There's a firefight going on, and we need to sort of listen to the command and control for that. Yeah. That was it, problematic, wasn't it? That, that. Well, well, it's, it's interesting because you know, what you were saying about social media as well, about how um, disempowering it can get if you're into a narrative which is, you know, very accusational about your leadership. And, you know, I've seen things online that pe people are like, you know, on, on, the, on an extreme 
case people accusing the government of like killing people and doing this that's that is very frightening speech it's very disempowering if you if you end up kind of going into that i mean on their side it's good that people have got passion to to see a different side it's always good to see different sides but it's not at the moment yeah. you don't need it at the moment and the person who's at fault in all of this is whoever's logging on to this and listening. Mm -hmm. All right, because you'll always have your trolls, you'll always have your idiots on TV. Yeah. You'll have those people who say controversy, and we know who they are. We don't have to name them, these celebrities on TV who come out with the worst things to say. Well, well they're, they're kind of not at fault because if you get rid of those guys, there'll be somebody taking the place because that's just how humans are. The person who's at fault are the production companies who are having them on TV mm. and you for watching the TV. Yeah. So yeah. you've got a choice in this world. If you don't like what I'm saying, you can turn, turn this computer off. So it's, so it's being 100%. I'm sure you won't because this is, yeah. this is fantastic. We're, we're, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's being 100% responsible for what we put into our own minds, basically. Yeah. And, being and I, think, I think we're in a period of time where we've got this rapid technology moving forward and and we're like wow this is incredible we can now do great conversations like this we can send photographs like that around the world you know we're all connected and we're all wow this is brilliant for somebody in his 50s who's seen who's seen the dial-up phones and, and all that sort of stuff you know it's 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 well it's even better it's like a disney world for me because it's this is wonderful for people born after 2000 then it's kind of just what is norm really um so you know it's it's wonderful but i think we're going to go through a period of going okay we've got this technology now and it will be very fluid within our lives and a lot of people will then go back to the other side of it of um, embracing the environment understanding the importance of community um, of actually taking time to live your life away from the screen um, though the screen is important I don't like it when people go oh Facebook we shouldn't have that we shouldn't well we should but let's learn how we have it because maybe they have got a few things wrong and freedom of speech is good but you know how much do we want to take in mm. does that make sense yes yeah yeah totally totally um I just wanted to kind of wrap up here and just ask you a few questions about some of the some of the most memorable or extreme experiences you've had on the ice or on on yeah, Everest. We to talk about expeditions, weren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to hear some stories of like. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Come on. No, no. This is this this has been absolutely brilliant so far. I really loving it. In the moment, mate. I mean, my my journeys are my journeys are my sort of are my blood, really. Mm. You know, it's just, you know, I've, I've stood and seen the curvature of the earth from Mount Everest. I've, I've stood in 360 of a white horizon and I've walked on unstable sea ice towards the geographic North Pole. And I've done things which only a few people have done. And I'm from Coventry, which is an industrial educational cultural area in the center of the UK which they don't sort of breed people like me usually so I feel quite blessed to have done this mm. um, but I see that as the as a business sense I see how I can you know make good of of my life so far so. yeah <clears throat> amazing amazing what do you uh, want to know? Do you want to know anything about bears and things like that? I, want, I wanted to know, um, you mentioned last time about what, a story when you were coming down on, off Everest. Mm. And there was, you, there, I mean, I've, I've heard all sorts of crazy stories about, you know, the, the trials up to Everest and the sort of extreme things um, that, can, that can happen. But you were dealing with taking somebody down, remember you said? Yeah, I think this is a good question to sort of end up on, if you like, because... Yeah it's the importance of what we do. We, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of people with money, a lot of people without money, a lot of the world is what it is. We all know what it is, but what is the importance of all this? Mm. Um, and I did an expedition on Everest and 350 plus people climb it every year, though it is still super hard to climb. 
Um, and in 2013, we spent, I spent 72 days on the mountain, three weeks training in preparation. And, and then we did the ascent and, you know, it's got a store back story of that as well. But the moment is when we were at 8,000 or just below 8,000 meters at camp four. And it's 72 days to that point. In my backpack, I had a, a unit to connect with 10,000 students worldwide. Um, and I was going to do the, the first live Skype call from the summit of Everest to those students and to the bosses of Microsoft and Skype. So no real pressure. <laughs> just, a little, just a little something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it, uh, that night it was minus 45, 50 mile an hour side wind. I clicked onto the, the safety line. It, there was darkness. We started to climb. There's four of us in the team, um, two Nepalese and uh, a, a doctor and myself. Long story short, 200 meters from the summit, uh, the first Nepalese guy dropped into the mountain and um, I pulled him towards me and I shouted him, are you okay? And he wasn't really, um, uh, he, he was dying basically. And then I turned back to uh, my colleague and I said, are you okay? And he said, my feet's frozen. I need to get out of here. And I looked for the fourth guy and he was all, already abseiling out into, into the lower section to camp four. So I was kind of left alone, if you like. And I could see this, the head torches of the climbers reaching the summit. And I knew I had 10,000 kids following this, our every move, if you like. So I needed to make a decision there and then. And I think, and this is the moment, you know, this is the moment you, you have. And in terms of, of decision making, you either have time to make a decision where you converse with colleagues or you make a decision based on experience and also who you are as a human being. Mm. And my decision was that I'd have bought the expedition there and then. And we carried this guy down 300 meters down and then he started to find his feet. And long story short, three days later, we hit base camp and we walked back into the villages and um, everybody on that expedition lived. Mm. Um, and my issue was, how, how would the children react to that decision? Because they wanted me to reach the summit because I'd reached the North and South Pole just the year before and had followed that. But that one act of turning back was more of a lesson mm. than waving a flag on the top of a mountain and my whole purpose of exploration in the beginning was to wave that flag but has now developed into why why do we explore in this modern era why do we call ourselves explorers what responsibility do we have to go on platforms like this and talk about how freaking brave we are but we're not mm. we we bleed so like everybody else so it's important to be honest. It's important to um, come back with honest stories and like Shackleton and, and uh, Neil Armstrong and people like that, great explorers who come back and speak about their, their adventures in an honest way. That's when you relate to human, other human beings. So. Amazing. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's, that's the perfect place to, to kind of conclude thank you so much mark that's been that's all right really i really enjoyed this it's been lovely speaking to you uh, i appreciate you setting this up as well because i think it's just in these times it's interesting whether you enjoyed everything i said whether you take it on board i don't know but there will be a snippet within that that will make you think and that's yeah. the important thing i oh, certainly brilliant mark thank you very much okay no problem and that's a wrap. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host. No representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>